Hello everyone, this is Brother Ben. Welcome to this Wednesday Bible study on the Church of the Eternally Secure. Get out your Bibles. No, I'm teasing. I'm trying to do my best Luke impression. Um, <laughs> that's what Luke does. He has, a, he has it really polished. Um, but uh, I'm here with Brene tonight, and unfortunately, Brother Luke cannot make it. Um, he, uh, I did talk to him today, and he was thinking that he might be able to make it. He said he was kind of 50-50. Uh, but it looks like he's he hasn't made it, and it's because he does feel like he's on the upswing. Swing. He definitely feels like he was he's on the upswing, um, and that he went to the doctor yesterday, urgent care, uh, said he got like five medications, so he's got a lot of uh, he's getting a lot of treatment, and he's definitely feeling better. But he's still kind of coughing and things like that, so it's making him it's difficult to do a a Bible study. But uh, again, Renee's here with me tonight. Um, we're on Ephesians five one. And uh, hello to everyone in the chat. And uh, Renee, I'm not sure if you want to say hello to everyone. Okay. Uh, yeah, you guys. And I'm actually, good to see you. Uh, I'm actually glad Brother Luke's going to take this time to rest. I, I want him to get fully recovered and come back strong. So if he needs a little bit more time to sleep and, and get let his body heal, you know, that's when our body heals when we're sleeping. Um, so uh, we will miss him tonight. But uh, everybody keep him in prayer. Uh, also, I want to say hello to any of the new viewers that have come over from my channel tonight on the invitation video. Thank you for coming and welcome. Uh, please review the um, chat room rules. Everybody's pretty good about that. We don't insult each other. We try to stick to the topic at hand and not debate other issues in the chat room. Uh, and, uh, the moderators will take care of anybody that wants to come in and stir up trouble. But as far as, uh, the study, please, uh, feel free to put your ideas or comments regarding the discussion. Uh, and if you have, uh, something that you, uh, a question in regard to the actual verse, uh, put it, uh, in caps and we will see that. So with that being said, I look forward to the study. Hey, Brother Ben, are you pulling up a couple of different versions uh, like Luke does? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Um, well, uh, yeah, so we we'll definitely do the KJV. I like to look at the new KJV just because uh, it's easier for me to read, but I do compare it with the KJV. And I also like one of the other reasons I like the K new K King James Version is that it gives you alternate uh, textual variations. So if there's a textual variant... Um, I, I like to I, I like to know what those are uh, for just for consideration. Um, so um, yes, uh, I'm not. Uh, we could use the amplified. Uh, that might be somewhat uh, informative. But uh, I'll uh, whenever you. I know you like the KJV, so uh, we'll start with that. And um, if you want to read uh, verse one and go until you feel like it is a good stopping point, then we can both uh, comment on that. Would that sound okay. a good idea? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's see. Yep, it's a semicolon and then another semicolon and then a period. So let's do 23 to 24. How's that? Oh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, wait. Okay, so it's it it's Ephesians 5 1, but um, we might want to re recap. Um, I was going to four. I'm so sorry. Yeah, I went back to four because I, I like to go back to where we were right. to look at what we were saying. Okay, uh, so we see in chapter four, he's saying, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Don't be bitter and wrathful and fight amongst yourselves. Be kind and forgive one another, even as for God, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Okay, that's the last thing we heard in Ephesians four. So we're going to continue. Be ye therefore followers of God, say, uh, as dear children. That's the first verse in Ephesians 5, and we can see where the therefore is, is continued thought from the prior chapter when it says uh, that we have been forgiven, God has forgiven us for Christ's sake. So be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. See, it's God's forgiveness uh, that actually motivates us to uh, love God. All right, be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, not to be his children, but because we are, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and has given himself for uh given himself for us, an offering 
and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. And you can go back. We'll stop there. We can, you can go back in the old Testament and it talks about how, when things were pleasing to God, when they were sacrificed to him, it was described as something that was a sweet smelling savor to him. It was a, a pleasing smell uh, is how it was described. And I think that that's a way for us to understand um, uh, God because he, he's using our senses, our physical senses to describe what's pleasing to him. So um We'll read that again and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. Uh, this book is is just so awesome. Uh, just like his other epistles, he confirms who we are already by faith. Uh, we're, we're God's children. We don't do these things to become God's child or to stay God's child. We do them because we love him because we are his children and it's due to Christ's sacrifice that we are accepted in the beloved. It's on Jesus's uh, it's because of Jesus that we are accepted. Uh, and so Jesus's sacrifice here was clearly pleasing to God. Uh, as Isaiah 53 says, he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. For my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. So we see here that that offering and that sacrifice was a sweet smelling savor to God. Okay. Um, yeah. Like Renee said, uh, I like uh, to cover what the previous chapter, whenever you see it, therefore, I like to go backtrack a little bit and see what, what the therefore is referring to essentially. And uh, I think a kind of a summary statement of the previous chapter was in Ephesians 4.32. It said, and be kind hearted, I'm sorry, and be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. So he started with a premise there. So since God forgave you, you therefore, uh, you therefore be imitators of God or also, you know, in that, in that sense, forgive others. And I, I don't know, uh, uh, forgive me if I seem a little scatterbrained, because sometimes I read these scriptures, I get my st spirit starts soaring, and it's hard to uh, get get my mind to say what I'm thinking. But when I woke up this morning, I, I something really crystal clear came came into focus, and it was, um, and I, I even knew this as an unbeliever, um, that I realized early on that, for example, I saw a lot of people, even myself, would chase after... Um, good feelings and uh, things that I thought would make me happy, I would chase those things rather than focus on the things that I, that I needed to do to make me uh, legitimately, legitimately uh, happy. So a lot of people, for example, they go gambling and rather than focusing on, okay, let me do the work that's going to actually give me a stable lifestyle where I can actually have the things that I want. Instead, they, they're, again, they're chasing after the kind of the cheap or trying try, try to take a shortcut essentially to uh, uh, you know, wealth, and, oh, and same things with feelings. Like some people would say, for example, uh, "Geez, I don't feel very good right now, so I'm going to go do drugs or whatever. I'm going to go eat something uh, that's going to make me feel happy." And it, again, you're. I think people a lot of times they chase after an, an, an end result and not focusing on uh, what you need to do first to to have those things uh, legitimately. Um, like, so for example, uh, again, I, I, I used to have a problem with, and I still have a problem to some degree, uh, with eating sometimes. So I, I just get into bad habits and I think it's going to make me feel better. I think it's going to give me this, the energy and whatnot to do all the work I need to do and end up feeling like crap. And yet I find now, uh, uh, kind of relearning what I already knew as a child that, uh, working out and, and taking good, uh, good care of myself and eating right. Uh, I find that not only do, do I not have that, that cheap high, I have a, a, a healthy high constantly. And not only that, I can eat, pretty much eat whatever I want and not have to worry about it because, again, I, I, I get the benefits without actually, I can experience the benefits without any of the uh, negative consequence. And uh, I kind of see that too with, with, with the, with, with, in the Bible, where uh, it's not only Paul teaching, but all throughout the Bible is that uh, we are. Uh, exhorted or admonished based on something that God already did. 
So rather than us chasing and, you know, the law kind of says, you must, you must be this, you must be this. And so uh, you must, you must achieve this righteousness. And yet that we can't do it. That's what the law does. The, the law is a curse. And yet because Christ took away that curse and because he, if we believe in him, we're already in him. He admonishes us to be these good things, the blessings that we can actually can be based on a, a past reality. And that past reality is, is Christ died for us. I'm not sure if I'm making any sense, but um, another a, a parallel I think is that Renee and I are talking before this program was that when I was a, uh, 10 years ago when I was completely confused, I didn't know the difference between Calvinism and Catholicism. Uh, I attended uh, Lutheran services with my wife and we were just kind of talking about all the fluff and the nonsense that goes on in various churches where you very get, you get very little expository teaching or really good Bible um, teaching at all. And what they do is if they take one verse and it's out of context, you'll be, you're lucky if you get one verse out of the entire sermon and they, they extrapolate it into some real world life experience, some feel good experience that really has very little applicability to what the Bible is actually teaching in that verse. And then also play some, you know, some old fashioned uh, organ music or some new kind of uh, music to kind of stir up some kind of spiritual high. And again, that's all fake. And yet, if you understand who you are really in Christ, you should have that, uh, you should be able to have that constant high. Um, all the time, a genuine constant high. If you, if again, if you reckon yourself dead to sin and alive to God, I mean, and you reckon, you realize that every day that you focus on your eternal life, it's the, uh, again, I just think it's, it's really interesting is that, and that's also how Paul's teaching here is that he's exert, he's exhorting these believers based on something that's already happened. So since you've are you Christ forgave you, that premise it's a given. That work has been done. Like I, I kind of to kind of go back to my workout experience, it, it, because that work's already been done. Now you can reap the benefits. So uh, live in that. Uh, um, and so that that's all. All his teaching is based on a past reality, essentially. Um, and so. Uh, Again, that's why he says, therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. Um, and obviously, as, as imitators, you know, how do we imitate God? Well, Christ was our perfect example of who God is. He was the perfect reflection of the Father. And um, he is the same essence of the Father. So we should we should look to him, obviously. Um, John one uh, eighteen says, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is the who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Um, first Corinthians 1, 11, 1 says, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. So again, Paul's also an example to us. Um, and we read previously where, uh, Ephesians 4, 32 said that God forgave us. So we should, for, that, you know, we should emulate that. We should for, forgive other people, both believers and, and unbelievers. Um, and again, uh, the Bible always starts with this premise and the new, and the new Testament under grace, it always starts with a, a starting premise and then based on that starting premise, we should be that. Because we already are that, we should live that way. And so, again, with uh, with 1 John 4, 19 says, we love him because he first loved us. So you see that starting premise, God loved us, and so now we love him. Um, we, you know, God sought us, so now we seek him. Uh, it, 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 so I think it's very important. That, that relationship and that order is emphasized all throughout Scripture. Um so I think that's a, that's a, a something that that came to me this morning, and I thought maybe I'd share that. And I think it's somewhat applicable here again. Just that uh, it, it's always a, a past premise. We need to remember who we are in Christ, and, and and by knowing that, that empowers us. And so we already have peace with God, so we can now uh, live with peace with other people. Uh, do you want to cover verse three and you, you continue on uh, for as long as you want, Renee? Uh, yeah, let me. And, and by the way, amen to everything you just said. It, it's so unfortunate that all of these verses, you know, all the stuff in the epistles and Jesus's own teachings are to his people. They're to his people. They're to people that are already belonging to God. And, and the instructions in the epistles of Paul are to already save believers. 
They're, they're how we're supposed to grow and build and make our faith profitable uh, into service of God and to be a light to the world. Uh, it's not, they, they just, we were saying in the chat, they take things and turn them into bondage and legalism instead of the heart of, of the Lord, which is love. It's all about love. And if we came from a place of love, always caring about how the other person felt, uh, we would, it, it would make a tremendous difference. But because so many people have a law and Old Testament mentality, they, they, they've, go, they've gone the way of Cain and become self-righteous, you know, and it's, um, it's pretty sad because a lot of these verses are, they've got little nuggets in there of, like you said, starting from our identity. It, the, the, everything stems from there. It comes from uh, the foundation being Christ. So let's see, this has got some semicolons. So three and four uh, are a semicolon. So let's see, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, that's a big one in the church, you guys. Coveting, I mean, advertising, Sets us up to do that. We always want something we don't have. Uh, or covetousness. Let it not be once named among you. As becometh saints. Neither filthiness. Nor foolish talking. Nor jesting. Which are not convenient. But rather giving of thanks. And we were talking about this jesting thing. The, uh, see uh, somebody was saying. See the Mennonites take this too far. You're not supposed to have a sense of humor. That's not. What's being said here? Jesting, which are not convenient. Okay. During a church gathering, uh, little jabs and funny little insults and stuff like that. It's just not convenient in a church setting. Okay. Also, the jesting here, any kind of communication that could have the potential to harm someone or make someone the butt of a joke is not convenient. It doesn't edify. It doesn't uplift. It's not saying don't have a sense of humor. Uh, so we can see these instructions are things that uh, a believer should have fornicating, being unclean, doing uh, being covetous, uh, filthiness and foolish talking, uh, any kind of corrupt communication. Everything we say uh, within uh, the community of believers should be to encourage and uplift. Uh, and so if we just have the, the core of that is love again, it's, it's to always make sure the other one is being, uh, fed and ministered grace to, and they're reminded of Jesus and his great love. This is our focus. You know, it should always be focus, but these things are turned into bondage and legalism instead of the the way they're meant to be taken you know uh it's just unfortunate that things that are supposed to encourage us actually are used to put people in bondage and and leave it to men they will pull one of these like the jesting like the mennonites do where you're not supposed to laugh tell jokes have a sense of humor anything they just, they go too far. So instead of being encouraged now, it's just sucking the joy out of everything. You know, God doesn't come to take away our joy or to make our life less colorful. It, Jesus came to give our lives, uh, to give us life more abundantly. So uh, once again, fornication, all uncleanness, let it not be once named among you as become a saints. So these are saints, and this is not becoming to a saint. This is not the way a saint should be perceived. And as we're growing in our walk, these things will hinder us. So um, it tells us don't do these things, but rather giving of thanks. So a spirit of gratitude and kindness and edification is what we're actually supposed to have here. But we got to remember not to turn this into legalism. Yes, sir. It was three and four. Three and four. 
Okay. So, um, so verse four, um, yeah, so, but uh, fornication, all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is, as is fitting for saints. And then again, as Renee said, it says, neither filthiness, nor foolish, foolish talking, nor, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, in, in parentheses, for, for saints, uh, but rather giving of thanks. So again, a saint is a brethren, it's a person who is born again, it's a believer, uh, it's a person who's righteous, uh, and so God, Paul here is going is about to make a, uh, some stark contrasts about believers and unbelievers, and uh, he's going to be emphasizing, okay, this is who you were, but no, you're not that any longer. So because you're not that any longer, don't don't live like the people that you once were and the people that are not saved. Don't live like a, an, an unsaved person. Uh, uh, the, uh, you know, a, a believer can do all the things that an unbeliever can do, but a an unbeliever cannot do the things that a believer can do in in God's sight. So they they can't uh, live for God. They can't uh, do righteous works. Um, so you know, why do the things that you died to? Why do the things that uh, again God's not pleased with? And so that's a, a, a kind of Paul setting up here. Um. And, and again, don't even let it be named among you. So uh, that that basically means you know anyone in the church that's you know living in unrepentant sin, uh, you know is kind of flaunting it. Um, that I, those people need to be set marked and avoided, and if necessary, uh, excommunicated from the church. I believe because they're giving they're bringing reproach on the name of Christ. And all throughout the Bible, I kind of studied this. Okay, when, when does God get most uh, angry with believers? And it's always uh, when they are bringing reproach uh, on the church. So they're either they're either bringing re reproach on the name of Christ, so they're misrepresenting him, uh, or they are uh, causing um, they're they're destroying um, fellow believers in terms of false doctrine or uh, sexual immorality, whatever it may be. They're they're causing uh, division. Those those are the kind of things that uh, God. Uh, deals with most severely um and so th that's why i think we do need to take church we if we don't take discipline um I, I if we don't judge ourselves god god will and i'd much rather judge ourselves before god has to intervene um so uh i, I think these are things that are important uh that's chris uh chris uh Christine asked can it can i answer that this verse you're just talking about about what I, and I want an idea what you think it is. Uh, the when it says uncleanness, I think it means lewdness, uh, communication that is of a lewd nature, uh, and uncleanness can be sexual and in practical sexuality or uncleanness in the sense of speech. What, what do you think? Uh, I I didn't look up that word. Um, I, I agree with you. It's probably just a general term for uncleanness. It probably if you look it up in Greek, it probably just means. I'm guessing it, it just means uncleanness. And and like you said, it could be sexual. It could be uh, verbal. Um, it could really be anything that uh, that we've been you know any any sin essentially. You know, let all uncleanness. Yeah, I I I'm getting the sense of um, like lewdness. Like a lewd behavior or lewd speech of any kind, right? Because I mean, the only time it's mentioned is unclean is either with food, sexuality, speech, and uh, leprosy. And I don't think it's talking about leprosy or food laws because we're not under them. So I'm assuming it's uncleanness would be uh, in sexual behavior or speech. Uh, that's what I'm getting from the sentence. Uh, Christiny. Um, yeah, it's, yeah. I, I guess it's it's a Greek word. It's uh, akatharsia, and it just basically means impurity, physically or morally, uncleanness. It's used ten times in the Bible. Um, I'd have to, you know, it would take me more time to do more research on that. But I think it probably just means literally uh, uncleanness. So, you know. Not, not necessarily physically uncleanness, but obviously in this context, be this uh, uh, spiritual uncleanness. 
And I don't know, Renee, do you want, Renee, do you want to continue with verse 5? Sure, yeah. Uh, let me see here. For this you know, and this is one that is... Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. Not, you guys. Pay attention to these next couple of verses, chat room, because this section is always taken out of context, all right? For this you know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, so he associates being covetous with idolatry, it's lusting after things, uh, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Now, standing on its own sounds scary, right? That sounds like you, you got to not do these things or, or you'll be lost. But I think the uh, encouragement here is as a saint, you shouldn't be doing these things like they do. People that are unclean and we'll we'll see in verse six i think six and seven the next one should be done together uh okay uh, i agree but I'll, I'll just do five for now okay uh well yeah I, I agree it's kind of it's kind of hard for me to separate this i have a lot to say about these verses too well, uh you go ahead and read uh, all three of them and then make your points and then i'll make mine Okay, I'll read in the New King James just because that's what I have up. And but if you want to read it again in in the King James, that's fine. So verse five it says, "For for this you know." So he's telling him something that you already he's already they should already be establishing this truth. No, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance. I think that that word inheritance is key there. Has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God? Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. Um, did you want me to say my commentary there, or my thoughts on that, or did you want to? Yeah, go right ahead. Okay. Go right ahead. Yeah, like Renee said, I think these, these verses, are they are scary. As a new believer, for me, they were terrifying. Um, um, and I, I think it's important, because like Renee said, there's two I think there's two errors in, in interpretation when, I read, when people read these verses. Um, one error is by Lord Shippers who say, oh, if you have a pattern of this, if you have a pattern of these sins in your life, then you're not saved and you, 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 are, you have no inheritance in the kingdom of God, which means you're not saved and you're condemned. Uh, if, you, if you sin too much, again, they can't tell you uh, how many sins uh, constitute a pattern, but uh, so they're, they're basically playing judge. Um, and, and so that's one mistake. And then also too, like, you know, if, if, if someone murders, if someone murders someone today, even, uh, uh in our secular world, you know, in, in, uh, in non-spiritual life, if, if someone murders someone, uh, we would call them a murderer. We, we don't, we wouldn't say, oh, well you murdered and then you, uh, did, uh, your time in prison and you did community service. So you're no longer a murderer. No, you're a murderer. And so we, we you know certain sins like that. We, we, uh, we put that label on people and they don't ever lose it. Uh, we don't t typically do that thing, do that same kind of thing when someone lies, but, um, uh, in God's eyes, that's exactly how it's done. If you, you, you it, it, to be a murderer, you only get to sit, you get to only murder once to be a liar. You only get to lie once. Um, so I think that's one, one, uh, very important point to make. Again, a lot of Lord shippers, Calvinists, uh, pretty much everyone who's not free grace, uh, they will say again. The, if you this, Paul's warning he these people here that if you have a pattern of these sins in your life, you cannot be saved. Uh, so that's the first error. The second error I think is, and this is typically um, I think people by the uh, uh, the ministry called Grace Evangelical Society of you know Bob Wilkin and Zane Hodges. Uh, which have a lot of good teaching. I, I generally like the stuff. I, I like to uh, listen to them, to them. But I think uh, they're 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 wrong in a couple areas. Uh, I think in a, in, in big ways. I think, but uh, yeah, they they teach that these verses are teaching that the inherit only faithful believers. So the, they're saying this these verses are not warning that you have if you have a pattern of these sins in your life that you're not saved. But they're not saying that. But what they are saying is that oh, if you have a pattern of these sins in your life 
then you have no inheritance, so you will not rule and reign with Christ. Uh, again, I think that's an error as well, and I, and I, I uh, will I, I'll unpack that here in a minute. But one thing I wanted to um, last thing I'll say before I pan it over to you, Renee. I just want to. Uh, I, I always like to compare scripture with scripture, and so there's two uh, parallel passages that are uh, that Paul also uses. The kind of the same language, and I think it's important because I think he's kind of uh, teaching the same thing here. And so, the first one is in First Corinthians six nine through eleven, where he says, "Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God?" Question mark. Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, were, past tense, some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of our God. And then finally, in Galatians 5, it's uh, verses 19 through 24. It says, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murderers, uh, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. Or so, so he says the like. He's not even giving you a complete list there. And so... Uh, you know that that list there is, is a catalog of of pretty much all of us in our flesh, and yet he's saying uh, not even those. That's not even a complete list. He says and the like. So there's other things that I think we can all think of uh, that would also be uh, evident as uh, manifestation of the flesh. And he says, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God, but. The fruit of the Spirit is joy, I'm sorry, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and so, and against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. Yeah, unfortunately, Ben, we, we call those uh, the famous sin lists. Right. And Ray Comfort and all those guys, they all take these out of context and say, see, if you do that, you're going to lose salvation or you weren't really saved or something. But all he's doing is dividing the old man, the flesh, from the new man, the spirit. Amen. And then reminding you that the flesh, which desires all these things, was crucified. That was crucified. So in your mind, you have to reckon that de that part dead in you so that you can live in Christ you can become alive and walk this and walk in newness of life in Christ so all these warnings like the unrighteous it will not inherit he's referring to the unjust unbelieving judges that the Corinthian church were taking their court cases to sue one another to so they were like wait a minute you're going to judge angels one day when you inherit the kingdom, yet you can't judge the smallest matters. You're taking it outside the church to these unjust men to decide your cases. You should just let your brother defraud you. Why are you taking him to court? Just let him get away with it. Leave it alone. But if you have to have a case, uh, you should be judging it uh, because the unrighteous are not going to inherit the kingdom. You will. So why are you trusting them with these matters? And that's what was there. We're, we're not the unrighteous. We're the righteousness of God in Christ. And so whenever he brings these sin lists up, he's telling the saints, that's how unsaved people act. We shouldn't be looking like them. We should look different than they do. We should be better at how we live. We should walk in more love. We should be light. We shouldn't be uh, doing these sinful things that the world does, as it says here, as become a saint. Don't let it be named among you. Just like Paul says, if, if um, or Peter, when he says, uh, let, 
let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a busybody in other, other men's matters or as a thief or an evildoer. But if you do suffer as a Christian, suffer for Christ. So it's clear here that there's nothing people forget. We still have free will once we're saved. We can uh, walk in the flesh, which leads to death, or we can walk in the spirit. Unsaved people don't have the spirit. They, they, they don't have anything but flesh. They're basically the walking dead. They, they just like our flesh was crucified with Christ, with all its passion and lust. They're eventually that flesh is is dead, too, because it hasn't happened in this time space, but it will. It's as good as dead. So the encouragement here is to not live like they do. And if you see this verse here uh, for this, you know, that no whoremonger nor unclean person or covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words for because of these things come at the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not their partakers with them, with them, with who? The children of disobedience. We are not the children of disobedience. We obeyed the gospel. And so when he says, be ye not partakers with them, he's talking about people that aren't saved. Don't partake in these sinful behaviors with them. That's not who you are anymore. So, uh, unfortunately, people just pull these verses, these great sin lists, out of context to try to get a believer in bondage and looking at themselves uh, and the dead letter instead of what it's supposed to do. That's not who you are. That's not who you are anymore. You were washed, justified, sanctified. In Christ, you should be a follower of God as dear children. That's who you are. That's what you're supposed to do. And honestly, I mean, all of us still have the flesh to contend with, but I didn't really have any victory over this stuff until I stopped looking at it, till I stopped looking at me and condemnation and fear. It, it's now, I know I'm saved. I know my father loves me and I don't want to hurt him or give him a bad name. That's my motivation. As the Bible says, you have not so learned Christ. We haven't learned the, to do these things in him. He hasn't taught us to do these things. We know this is not uh, what he desires of us. So um, I think it's important. I, I'm glad we stopped to really discuss this. And I, and I agree with you, Ben. I am in huge disagreement with GES on their dividing up the, the kingdom of God into those that inherit. Some won't go into the, this city and some won't have this inheritance. Yeah, there's reward and loss of it, we know, but these verses are about unsaved people. They're not they're not going to inherit the kingdom because they're not saved. That's why. Uh so they're the children of disobedience. Believers are not the children of disobedience and the wrath of God does not get poured on the children of God. We are not appointed to wrath. So when it says the wrath of God comes upon the children of disobedience, we're God's children, not the children of disobedience. People need to know who we are and what God says about us in scripture, how he describes us. He never describes his children as children of disobedience. We might be a disobedient child of God, but not children of disobedience because we know that their father is the devil not God. So um, I agree with you, uh, Ben. I, I'm a little disappointed that they take that view because it kind of destroys what the actual context has been. It, it's clear here. He's saying, don't be partakers with them. Who's them? The children of disobedience, the unsaved, they're not going to inherit the kingdom. You will. You shouldn't be acting like those that won't inherit. Uh, and so if you take that away from the context, it doesn't really make sense. If you say that these are believers that just won't have certain inheritance rights, it, it, it falls apart in its actual context. It just doesn't make sense. So uh, I agree with you. I, I don't think that that's what that means at all. I think the children of disobedience are clearly unbelievers. We're children of God and the wrath of God is not appointed to us. 
He's saying, you know, God's wrath's going to pour on people because of this stuff, because they're not saved. And so mm -hmm. Jesus took the wrath for our sin as believers. The wrath was poured on him, not on us. He's our substitution for that. It doesn't mean we're not chastised when we are disobedient kids, but his wrath doesn't come down on us because chastisement is a matter of correction and restoration, not wrath. Wrath is judgment. And no judgment is going to come upon God's children from God anyway. Yeah, totally. I mean, the the... the... The Bible uses titles, and it, the title is where, you know, we're, we're known as overcomers, or believers, or brethren, or saints, and we did these, we, we achieved these, this status in God's eyes because we believed on Christ. It, and once we have that title, we forever have it, and, and yet, uh, so it, 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 it's a title that kind of abides on us forever, uh, whereas an unbeliever who never believes, they are known as the sons of disobedience, the children of darkness, the uh, sons of darkness, the uh, accursed children, so, sons of wrath. Um, and again, just following the contextual uh, clues that which are systematic, I think we need to be very systematic with our interpretation, and it's not difficult to do. For example, it says the wrath of God comes on the, the sons of disobedience. Well, why does God's wrath come upon them? Because the law brings about wrath. Where there's no law, there is no... There's no offense. There's no no disobedience. Uh, these lordshippers try to use the law against believers unlawfully. Timothy said, or Paul said, I think it's a Timothy said, the law is good if one uses it lawfully, but you can't use the law against a, a believer lawfully. Why? Because they're not under the law. It's like saying, it's like telling Christ, pointing to Christ, say, trying to find fault in him uh, with regards to the law. And that's exactly what the Pharisees tried to do. They tried to tried to find fault in Christ under the, uh, under the law. But again, he fulfilled the law and we are in him. So we are in that sense uh, above the law or fulfilled the law. Um, it, the, no, the law can't be used to condemn us. And so where there's no law, there's no wrath, there's no, there's no death. Um, and so, for that reason, we should not be partakers with them. And, um, yeah, so I, I think it's it's beyond obvious um, that these are definitely not— I think it's, it's, it's uh, inexcusable that any person would try to apply these verses, these, like, like Renee said, these uh, sin list verses or vice catalog verses to believers and to say, oh, if you have a pattern of these, then you're either not saved or you have no inheritance— um, again, the, the contrast is stark that Paul's making here, uh, and he'll even draw it out even further where he's talking about light and darkness as a common theme, uh, in, 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 uh, Ephesians talk about light and darkness. It's a common theme. And that draws us back to, um, Genesis where God separated the light and the darkness. You can't mix the two. Um. And with regards to uh, in the inheritance, again, as GES, I like, uh, I, again, I, I like a lot of things that GES does, but two things I strongly disagree, and I, I personally am certain they're wrong on, are these verses that they say are applicable to believers, not in terms of salvation, but losing an inheritance. I'm, I'm totally convinced of that, and I'll, I'll touch on that here in a second, but I'm also uh, grieved by their their insistence that outer darkness is referring to believers i think that's gross <laughs> a gross interpretation um i mean so it, it, just even in terms of um trying to apply these these verses to uh believers um well paul, again being systematic paul people i think a lot of times don't don't consider what they already read uh and we read in verse one uh of 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 ephesians uh, where paul said uh that he called them to the, he said he addressed this whole, uh, this whole epistle to the quote unquote, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. And so again, they're saints. And so whenever he uses the word you throughout the epistle, he's talking to saints. He's not talking to people who might be saved, who are, he's not certain about, or they're on the fence or a mixture of believers and unbelievers. Yes, there might've been unbelievers been unbelievers in the church, but that's not who he's writing the, the epistle to. He's writing it to believers. Um, and 
Uh, so again, these pistols aren't really meant to be evangelistic. They're they're meant to build up the the the, the people who already are believers uh, in Christ. And so, uh, you know, in, in terms of the inheritance, um, Paul had previously said in verse in verse three of Ephesians one three with regards to again to answer this question: if he's if this inheritance, do all believers have an inheritance, or only faithful believers have an inheritance? Uh, that's what I think what I'm trying to get to here. And again, in verse three of Ephesians one, he said, "Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us." with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. And then he says in verse in Ephesians verse Ephesians 1 verse 11 he says in him also we have we have past tense obtained an inheritance. So he's already saying all believers have an inheritance. So to say that this is uh again uh only to faithful believers who don't uh practice these sins again that's not that flies to the face of what Paul already established. Um, and then again, uh, in Ephesians 1, verses thir 13 through 14, he says, You were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance. So again, we have an inheritance. Um, and then again, in eight, verse 18 of Ephesians 1, he says, uh, he, Paul prays, he says, that the eyes of your heart uh, understanding be enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints so all saints have an inheritance yeah because um, we're joint heirs with christ exactly exactly so we all have an inheritance um again in colossians 1 12 it says giving thanks to the father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light <laughs> so you, you see the theme of the light the saints the uh, inheritance the word partakers these are all things that we enjoy and will receive because we're beneficiaries because we're in christ now with that said um the, i i believe he, the bible teaches that all believers will have an inheritance but uh, certain faithful believers will have what they call what's referred to as the, re the reward of the inheritance. Um, but before I move on to that, I think it's very important to make clear why these unbelievers have no inheritance in Christ. It's not because they they uh, practice these sins or committed these sins individually or as a pattern, but it's or that it was because that Christ didn't die for their sins. No, it's because they never trusted in Him alone. And, and had been justified and forgiven uh, with totally and completely forgiven forever that they because they never trusted him. It wasn't because they committed those sins. It's because they were never in Christ. Um, and again, it's, it, it, I think it's abundantly clear that, uh, you know, P Paul says that they that they uh, that these unbelievers that that again, that manifest these sins as God sees them uh, um you know the law. They're under the law. They, what the law does to for an unbeliever, because it, we have no righteousness, uh, all the law can do is identify sin. And so that's why a lot of these verses they spell out these sins. Whenever you see a verse that spells out these sins, especially uh, it, the first clue is okay. These are unbelievers because it's identifying them uh, under law, law legal terms, and so they're under the law, and so the law can only identify. Uh, faults and guilt and so that's why he's uh, enumerating all these different sins because that's who god sees they who they are they they the wrath of god still abides them abides on them and unless they believe they will die in their sins um and so like for example we were talking a, co a couple days ago about revelation and who are these people on the outside who uh love and practice a lie and are unclean and fornicators and and fearful well that's <laughs> I think it's clear that these are people who died in their sins. Who dies in their sins? Unbelievers. I don't think this is. Uh, I don't think this is uh, meant to be very difficult, or or we're supposed to take things out of, out of, you know, as if they occurred in a vacuum. We learned all through Scripture who who these people are, um, and so real quick, uh, you know, to, to give it, give an illustration. Uh, say, uh, for example, I'm 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 an elderly father. I have three sons. 
and uh, my last 10 years of life, I was deathly ill. I was uh, bedridden, and one of my sons tended to my every need uh, over those last 10 years. He, he lived by my side. He gave up uh, he gave up having a wife and a family. Uh, he gave up having a, a great career to take care of me. Um, and then when I die, and you know, when when the lawyers reading out my last will and testament, he's gonna give. He's gonna the 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 uh, the father is gonna bequeath or bestow uh, an inheritance to all his sons just because they were his sons, just like God. We're all we're all sons of God, so he's gonna give us a gift. Uh, an inheritance just because we're sons but to that particularly faithful son i'm going to give him a, a, a reward quote unquote of the inheritance i'm going to give him a little bit above and beyond because of his faithful service to me and there is a verse that talks about that i think it's more than one verse but um there is a verse that calls about the uh, reward of the inheritance um and uh i guess i could oh Yes, here it is. It's in Colossians 3, 23 through 24. I think there's other verses, but this is one of them. It says, And whatever you do, do it, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. Again, this is because they were doing, he's saying this, that whatever you do, do it heartily, unto the lord if you do it unto the lord then you receive the reward of the inheritance so, again essentially something above and beyond what every believer will get anything you want to say about that renee or do you want to go to the next verse yeah, I or the click. i couldn't get the clicker on the microphone okay <laughs> yeah um it, it's clear uh we are joint heirs with christ and that's not something we earn it's something that is given to us as a gift i don't know what reward like is in eternity uh i know it talks about crowns and then there's that we cast crowns at his feet we don't even deserve to be there uh and so we can only use what scripture says but there you know there's a lot of language in scripture that if unless you like go back and understand, you know, the idioms of the time and uh, it, it can be it can really lead to false teaching. Uh, and that's why some of it, sh you know, some people give private interpretation to scripture a lot. And I have to be careful when I'm looking at it. Did I did I go to the Old Testament? Is it is anything like it is the same kind of wording used in the old testament you know because a lot of times god will uh give you its meaning within his word uh so yeah that's all i had to say about that but well uh where i think we're at verse eight we're verse eight okay for ye were sometimes darkness but now see here it is again ben yeah. where it's like you were that but now you're this it's it's a confirmation of what you you no longer are. So you shouldn't act that way anymore because it's not who you are. And that has to be at the core of it. We're not doing this to become. We're doing it because we already became. Uh, for ye were sometimes darkness, but now ye are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. The fact that he has to uh, give the command to walk as children of light implies that there's a choice to be made amen you know again we're told not to grieve the holy spirit whereby we're sealed until the day or unto the day of redemption but we we don't it's not like we still don't have a choice god doesn't force us and that's what drives me crazy about a lot of these calvinist teachers if you're really saved you'll do this this and this you're that that is just denying that there's an old man to contend with there is one you know and all of these epistles are telling us to deny that guy he died he's dead don't feed him don't bring what did you say don't resurrect that guy keep walking forward walking in your identity for ye were sometimes darkness but now you're light in the lord walk as children of light 
For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. So I'll I'll stop there. Okay. Yes, I, I totally agree. Um, yeah, in verse 8, too, it says, you know, the you there, again, uh, just as we were in verse 1-1, one, one, uh, I'm sorry, Ephesians 1-1, one, one, where it says, uh, you know, to the, to the saints. Again, I think that you mentioned earlier, uh, Renee, that... Um, that you kind of used to kind of skip or kind of glaze over the uh, opening passages, the salutation and the uh, what's the what's the end called or the greeting and the I don't know the the end, beginning very beginning of an epistle the very end, um, and I used to do that too, and then I I realized ah you know what every word got a man should live by every word that you know out of the mouth of God, and I realized I bet there's clues in there and there is and. Uh, it helped me address this question, and people would say, "I'll tell you, well, no, this epistle, these are fence sitters, or these people are um, unsaved." Uh, you know, he's jumping around talking to the unsaved, addressing the uns addressing unsaved in the congregation for the saved. It's like, okay, well, who, who's going to be arbiter of of what verse applies to ver believers and unbelievers? I believe the Word of God tells us exactly. Exactly, we don't have to guess on that. And again, when he says you. We can assume from that starting premise that he's talking to saints, born again believers. So, the ver in verse eight, the you there is a, is a, a, a is plural, um, which is again referring to all the believers in Christ uh, at that church, um, and Paul's audience, uh, you in verse eight. Um, he again sets the contrast between them, which is verse seven, which is don't do not be partakers with them. So you see that contrast of light and darkness, you them. Um, I th I, again, I think it's so important to keep these themes uh, in in in, port in our interpretation. You know, let them weigh in on our interpretation. And so again, I don't think this passage is contrasting obedient believers with diso disobedient believers, as like people like in, in GES might claim. But instead, it's contrasting the children of God with the children of wrath. So uh, you know, once again, we see the logic of grace. It's it's an appeal to godly Christian living by by God's grace based based on what Christ has already done for us and the believers in Him as children of light, um, and so again that's just I, I tried to make that point earlier but I did a poor job but I was saying basically you know true happiness and true uh, being uh, and success and victory only comes from like work that was already done. So like, for example, like I said, I was chasing after feelings, uh, but not putting in the work, trying to take a shortcut. And once I found that I actually did the hard work, all those feelings would just come naturally. And I didn't have to, and they were real. They were not, uh, you know, artificial or temporary. Uh, they were long lasting. Uh, and that's how we, uh, we should live the Christian life. We should recognize that, the work has already been done, but we didn't do it. Christ did it, and we, we get all the benefits. And God, God just simply now asks us to walk by faith and walk consistent with who we are in Christ. Um, and I think I'll stop there for that verse. Um, so I think we're, that will lead us to that verse 9. Do you, you want me to read verse nine? Yeah, you... sorry. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You want to start start with verse nine? Sure, sure. Uh, let's see. For the fruit of the spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. So uh, once again, we see what you're not and what you are, what you shouldn't be, what you should be. Um, so it's saying the fruit of the spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Uh, and the unfruitful works of darkness should be reproved. So what's acceptable to the Lord, what's not acceptable. But when you do see these things, reprove them or correct it, uh, among the believers. If you see believers acting the way unbelievers act, it should be reproved. Don't join in with them. But, uh, you know, address it, I think is what it's saying. Yeah. This, uh, stop there. Uh, well, well uh, did you read uh, verse 11? Yeah. And have okay. no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Okay. So this personally is one of the 
uh, this verse always kind of kind of troubled me. Um, because this verse is quoted often, but it's always cut short. So I'll read it here. It says, uh, for the fruit of the, the, um, sorry, for the fruit of the spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable, acceptable to the Lord and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is, and so most people stop right there. Uh, they say have nothing to do with unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. So they think it's their duty to uh, talk about all these wicked acts and go into great detail about all these wicked acts that unbelievers do, because um, they think, oh well, see, I'm not having anything to do with it. I'm exposing them. Um, but they they don't. But then they don't read on to the next sentence. Uh, because it says, for it is shameful, shameful to even speak of those things yes. which are done by them in secret. And they, yeah. always, they always cut that off. Um, yes. <laughs> and so, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm glad you picked up that. Because that, that really, um, I, I, I really, that troubled me. Because I'm guilty of this too. I, I'm not I'm not saying I, I'm uh, sinless in this respect. And so I, I kind of, I, I struggle with this. Okay, well, I know we're supposed to expose them. But the word expose really just means reprove or correct, like yeah. you said. And so uh, I think sometimes they uh, use that word expose. I think they use it, uh, you know, they like that. that, that word. They they purposely use the word expose rather than improve or correct. That's, that's but you know how? Go ahead. It, it tells us how. Look, this is why I was going, yes, he caught it. Yes, he caught it. <laughs> it's <laughs> rather reprove them. Hold on. All right. Y'all going to love this. For it's a shame to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. So how do we reprove them? By doing the opposite. So ah. we, it's a shame of uh, to even speak of the things that are done. So how are they reproved? By having a higher standard in our own behavior. By not doing it because when you uh are showing uh god's way it shows how dark god's the the wrong way is and so uh let's let's look at all of it together have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness but rather reprove them for it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret but all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. And so, yeah, it's, uh, for one, we, we are to correct it, especially if it's a believer. But it having the the light, uh, uh, light shining on it, for one, bring it out into the open, right? Because only the, the darkness keeps these things hidden. It allows it to fester. It allows it to continue. We're proving it. Uh, bring it out into the light. Uh, but it, it seems here that when it says all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. And so I think it's, um, it's actually the church's love and godliness that actually exposes it to be as dark as it really is. Because I think a lot of people, they they put up with, with evil because uh, it's not too bad, right? Until you see the opposite of it and you realize you can see how, how evil it actually is next to what is light. And the light of God's word, God, you know, it's God's word and, and the love of God in Christ that exposes and reproves these things and so when i uh see this here a ben it seems that as believers if we see you know he tells us how to deal with it one-on-one -on -one, as it, then we go to the leaders then we go to the whole congregation etc before we make any people love to expose other people though don't they ben they just oh, yeah. love to put out their dirty laundry and that's not what this is saying to do by the way it's not we need to we need to reprove it in the sense it needs to be corrected, but the light of God's word and the uh, having the light of of truth and 
what is right next to it is what shows it to be as dark as it is. You see what I'm saying? Uh, yeah, absolutely. All are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. If it brings it out, it it's light. It re it reveals it for what it is. There's a lot of things the world accepts as good, and the Bible clearly calls evil. and And we're told that good will be called evil, and evil will be called good. But now there's so many things that are accepted that God hates, that people are fighting for. It's it's sad. It really is. Only in the light of uh, light of truth can we see how it's not good. For one, I, I mentioned, uh, uh, for instance, Ben, greed and pride. The whole thing of celebrity. Oh, they made it. Okay, that's evil. To elevate yourself and to desire more and more and more stuff building your treasures. People are promoting this as success. And that's a successful person. They're spiritually and morally bankrupt, but they made it, Ben. Oh, yeah. So evil's called good and good's called evil. Yeah, and, and you know, and also, too, it's like, again, a lot, a lot of pastors, for example, they love to go into detail, great detail about all the, you know, for example, they'll get their te even their testimony sometimes. I think it's important, you know, pe people will, uh, when they get their testimony, uh, they'll go into great detail, almost bragging, like, oh, this is how many women I've slept with, and this uh -huh. is how much how much drugs I've done, and this is how much, you know, they, they all their exploits and how clever they were. Um, and, yeah. again, I, I, you know, even when the Bible talks about sins, you know, like the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, it doesn't talk about the detail, the sins, I think, plural. Um, it doesn't go into great detail, you know. It, it, the Bible uses things like euphemisms, and we can all get the idea, you know. We, right. We're all wicked. We don't. We can all. Uh, we all can uh, come to the right conclusion. I think uh, it's not difficult for us to to imagine what a person's talking about. Uh, we all are sinful, um, and so like, the Bible says things like, you know, uh, if a man lay with another man or something, you know, it, it's you know, we don't need to go into detail. Um, and again, the Bible, I can't think of a single verse where the Bible goes into detail about that kind of thing. It's just very, you know, like talking about the the, the Israelites giving their children over to uh, Molech. Uh, it doesn't go into great detail. Um, um, but we're a lot of, again, a lot of pastors, a lot of people give their testimony. They go into great detail, almost like they're, like I said, they're bragging. Um, and, and not only, not only is it, 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 Illuminati, the disgusting things people yes. tell people. yes. Yes, exactly. It only it only defiles you. Even if you're, uh, uh, you know, it, it can only defile you and make you weak. Uh, I know that from experience. You can't unvisualize it. Right. Some right. of the things that have traumatized me. Right. These things that they say they went through during satanic ritual abuse. Why do I need to hear the gruesome details of what were done to little children? I can't hear it. I right. can't unsee it. That's exactly right. You know? I think that's more curiosity than anything. It right. doesn't need to be. We just, you can say certain things were done without speaking of it like that. Right. Right. And again, with these people that would brag about their previous exploits, even they, uh, not only, I think, are they kind of bragging about what they did before, but not only that, but, oh, well, see, I've overcome all that. And so, um, you know they'll, they'll give they'll be careful to give glory to God, but they're you know they, they are really uh, a lot of times not always but a lot of times uh, you know trying to lift puff themselves up um, like oh, I, I overcame all this stuff you know I don't have this I can think of a few people that come to mind right now and they're Lord Shippers of course um, but yeah the, the, you know and so I think it, this verse did bother me for a while it didn't bother me anymore but I, I just kind of like okay well. Yeah, I mean, how, how do you expose things without talking about them? Well, I think it's basically saying, like you said, uh, it's not necessarily saying don't talk about them necessarily, but don't make a point, you know, be careful how you speak about them and don't speak about them without reproving them. You know, just don't bring them up for the sake of bringing it up, but Amen. always make it a teachable moment and use the word of God to, to shed light on it. And again, use euphemisms and things like that. Uh, you don't have to go into great detail. I I uh, could I know like you said, Renee, I, I definitely um was foolish and looked down those dark 
pass and once you stare in the darkness it's like it's it's it it, it, it almost sucks you in you it know breaks, Not, it yeah. breaks pieces of you down right traumatize right, right. You know, Absolutely. I can't even repeat some of the things I've heard, and I won't. People go tell me. No, I won't, because I wish I had never heard it. I wish I had never had that thought in my head. That's why one of the reasons early horror films were so uh, effective, because the, the implication, the imagination was far worse than what we could see on the screen. You know, and so to not have uh, gruesome details, we, we don't need to discuss these things. And I, I really think. There's something important here that the darkness is really exposed by the light of love. Like when you are walking in God's ways, it really exposes the darkness next to it. Yes. Church should be such a light that that people should know there's it doesn't even have to preach against it. It's that we're doing it differently. We're not partaking in it. It should shed light on it, you know? Right. Because the law is mostly thou shalt not. Right. And, it, and the law can only make you weaker. It only arouses us in the flesh. And like you said I, at the very beginning, that when you read these verses, they only made you more sinful, essentially, because you, you felt guilty and then you felt, I don't know, I'm not to speak for you, but I forgot what, what your wording was. But it's basically, yes, it's the law and it said, don't do these things. And it made you only more fearful and made you, uh, maybe, uh, maybe more fearful, maybe. Um, uh, self -focused. Yes, yes. And uh, in fact, you know, 10 years ago, uh, Jack Smack, I remember, uh, he, I, 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 he, he He's not everyone's cup of tea, but um, he, again, everyone, uh, for me, he is exactly what I needed to hear. I needed to someone to be up front in my face and, you know, let's cut the crap, cut cut out the religious BS. And, um, you know, he smacked me around. And, and it's because I, I, I remember he, he I was listening to one of his teachings and I made a comment in one of his videos. It was one of these verses, one of these vice catalog uh, verses. And I, I, I basically put it out there hoping that he would explain it, but I, I was foolish and like I was kind of like you saying, well, what about this, you know? And 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 I, in my heart of hearts, I knew it was grace, but I just could not reconcile. Again, right. I, I knew nothing, but in my heart of hearts, I knew it was all pure grace, and I refused to believe uh, that God was like uh, that. There was no hope, you know, if you did right. these things. I, 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 I just knew that was a God. Um, and uh, again, I think you have to really willingly suppress the truth to, to come to that conclusion and so i put that verse out hoping that someone would explain it to me and he did and i never for, for, forgot it um but it, yeah like you said it, it's it's the law it and it made but before i had, had an understanding of it it did uh it made me more uh it made me feel worse and, it, and i feel like okay what the heck i there's no way i can do it i might just throw in the towel give up give and up. give yep. into it that's right Yep. Give up. I've heard so many people leave. They they never really got saved because they still thought they believed Jesus down the cross, but they also thought you had to live a certain way or you wouldn't get to heaven. And they gave up because they realized, you know, the law made them guilty, but they didn't know that. They and so they became atheists. Yeah. I, I've seen guys that are fighting against Christianity because they think God is going to torture you for all eternity because you didn't live up to some impossible standard. And right. they never got the true gospel. And it's because of verses like this being taken out of context. It get, it, it took them away from God, right. not to them. It should have broke them where they were like, uh, well, who could stand? That I remember yelling that at God. If this is true, Lord, who would stand? I remember yelling that at him because I had such a heart for him. And I kept hearing all these mixed messages. And I said, if this, what this man is saying is true, who is going to be standing on judgment day? I don't know anybody that can live up to this. Right. And I think also, like you said, it drives people away. And then, so what they do is I think a lot of times they'll go into find some other false religion that talk tickles their yep. ears that does yep. give them, Oh, I, I am a God or why well, I am a, yep. you know? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And That's also, true. too, go ahead. No, it's true. I was agreeing with you. Yeah, uh, and 
I, you know, I, I don't, this, I, this is a verse I wanted to study more, but uh, when I read this verse, it's like, it just, it sent shockwaves through me. And I think, uh, again, I, I might have interpreted it wrong. I haven't really studied it in depth, but um, it's so in Hebrews 2, 2 to 14, it says, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had power over death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So I was like, wow, that's absolutely it. All to me, I think all sin basically comes from your 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 fear of, fear of dying. And so, whenever you feel like you, 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 there's condemnation over you, uh, that you're, you know, the wrath of God abides on you, you will. It puts you into greater bondage because you feel like you're worthless. God hates you. Uh, it's 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 uh, it's 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 impossible to please God. It's impossible to live up to His standards. Um, and that's exactly what the law is supposed to drive you to. So you so you realize His mercy, but. Um, I think that's why people. I think that's why people. That's why we sin. Essentially, uh, we are sinners, of course. But it's the fear of death, and so I. I, I think something fundamentally, uh, it's spiritual, very deep and spiritual. It's like it's almost like, almost like we're sin because we we fear death, and uh, I mean, there's a lot that can be said about that. But um, I think that's a, for me. That was like it just that that verse, verse fifteen, just uh, blew my mind. Uh, uh, Rich Bob was saying something interesting about that. You know, we were talking about darkness and stuff, and he was talking about the the man's wife who had been raped and cut into twelve pieces. Yeah. And the men, and he he put the quote there of of these were hardened men of war that wept for a month because they had uh, never heard of anything so gruesome. Like they had never, they were broken by it. And these were men of war that were used to, you know, being around carnage. So, yeah, it's, that was a good point. I forgot about that story, probably because I wanted to. There's a few things in the Old Testament that are hard to hear. I can tell you that. Yes. <laughs> really are. But, you know, in the light of the prophetic and the shadows and everything, it, it all makes sense now. But at, at before, it, I mean, even now, there's some things in the Old Testament that are hard. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I agree. I remember reading the Old Testament, again, uh, when I didn't understand much and thinking, I know this is the word of God, but it, it just sounds like it, it, it sounds like, it like a madman, you know? But then, yeah. like, like you said, once I understood it, all of this is prophetic, these all make yeah. sense. It does seem like it's just, it seems like uh, just like random ramblings um, to an unsaved person. Uh, yeah, it, it, it did that way to me. And it looks like God's a maniac. Right. Just goes around slaughtering people. Um, it is already 11. Yep, I saw that. Yep. Can't believe it. Just flew by. But yeah. we sure missed Luke. I did miss Luke, but you did a great job, Ben. Oh, thank you. Okay. I was nervous, but <laughs> um, right. yeah, Luke, you're definitely, mi I'm sure he's listening. And Luke, you're definitely missed. We're all praying for you. Um, when I talked to you earlier, you, you sound like you thought that you were on the upswing feeling better but just didn't feel like uh he was probably he was coughing too much to to really t uh do you know speak tonight but uh you're sorely missed and looking forward to have you back next uh wednesday but i'm sure we'll we'll have you back sooner than that on friday um but other than that renee I, uh thanks a lot for uh joining me um i really had a great time and really super uh edifying and enjoyable um bible study yeah, thank you. And thank you guys for your comments and questions in the chat room. Thank you for uh, the new people that came and stopped by. I appreciate you hanging out with us. And again, Brother Luke, we don't want you to come back until you're healed. I don't want you to get set back and then be out longer. You know, so you just take whatever time you need to rest till you're fully recovered and strong. Yep. And also, too, uh, happy Thanksgiving to everyone uh, in the United States, anyways. Uh, tomorrow, do you have plans, Renee? Oh yeah, gonna go eat with family tomorrow. My sister, my my dad, and his wife are gonna be at my sister and her husband's house, so we're all going over there. She is a great cook. I'm not, 
she's the kind that like keeps a great house and she does everything, makes the bacon, fries it up in the pan. She goes, she does everything. She works as a nurse. She keeps a great house. She's a wonderful cook. She got all that talent. I didn't get any of that. <laughs> she, we go to her house for like <laughs> for eating because <laughs> uh, I make great dinner reservations. That's about it. Yeah. In Michigan, we have some of the most restrict restrictive, uh, uh, I don't know. We have stipulations. We can't. You can't have anyone over your house even anymore. Um, oh, yeah. It's it, it's not. I mean, I have in laws that live a couple houses down. They can't even come come over. Although uh, right. they probably will sneak over. But um, yeah, it, it'll still be good. I, I have my my daughter's home uh, from college, so we're gonna. My wife's got you know a lot ready to go and prepare, so it'll be a good time. Um, all right, everyone. Uh, what does Luke, Luke say? Uh, bless, bless you all in the name of our great Savior, God. <laughs> uh, yep, Jesus. Okay, thanks a lot, everyone. Good night.